uh, before we start. As I, as I uh, watched many uh, TEDx lectures, I thought I'd start off by throwing the script a little bit and doing a big cliche. And my cliche is to interact with the audience. Oh no, it wasn't like that. Right. Um, in terms of your political ideology, who would identify as a right winger? If you do, please stand up right now and wave at everyone else. <laughs> Very good, thank you. And for those who are uh, a renowned Marxist, please stand up and wave at the audience. Sure, that's fine, that's fine. In fact, I have to say, this is not an easy question. I can suppose that a lot of you have political ideologies. I know that I asked uh, on the extremes of the spectrum, but the thing is this, most people won't be comfortable talking about what they think about politics and what they think of government in everyday life. In fact, I don't think you guys will even want to bring it up in conversation because it might incite some tensions between your friendship circles. I, I, I assume that's correct. Now, in this lecture that I'm going to give you, I'm going to explain how this is actually a force of great danger. And what I'm describing right now, the, 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 through the demonstration, is the concept of indifference. When people are indifferent towards something. Now, I'm basically saying that in certain scenarios, this is worse than negative emotions. The lack of having emotions towards certain things in society can be worse than having bad emotions, such as anger, fear, or desolation, I don't know. Because with anger and evil and these driven uh, sort of emotions, you can achieve something. Of course, there's a lot of bad that can be done, but at the same time, being angry towards the government for doing something bad, for silencing your rights, or being angry at, well, anything in particular, sometimes can produce a good result. For example, writing some lovely music or performance art or something that you find um, slightly edgy, but uh, some people might enjoy. So, um, this is Donald Trump, and um, in the year and a half since the election of this Donald Trump, the United States liberal commentators have queued up at the door to suggest that this 45th president is the single greatest threat to liberal democracy and the free world. Now, this reaction and the ongoing indignation at this anthropomorphic cheetos shows the extent to which the political class in the Anglosphere is also out of touch with ordinary people and what they think about politics. Now, in order to illustrate my point, I need to bring in a certain person. Uh, he is a very, very brave man to have gone through all this and lived to tell the tale. His name is Elie Wiesel. Elie Wiesel, although he was speaking nearly 20 years earlier than Donald Trump and modern day um, um, political commentators, has far more to say about injustice than many of those who have succeeded him on the platform of political discourse. Because he, well, he, he, he's passed away recently, but in his lifetime, he has experienced hell on earth. His reason for admission is simple. He was the son of two Romanian Jews. And he was one of the millions of people who found themselves firmly clasped by the poisonous grip of the final solution. Now, he was first housed at the infamous Auschwitz camp, before moving to the lesser known but equally horrific Buchenwald camp where he was sent to do forced labour. This is a very famous photograph of uh, the Buchenwald camp uh, room and this man here is Elie Wiesel. But the camp was liberated, by the, sorry, by the time the camp was liberated in 1945, his father was dead, his mother was dead and his younger sister was dead. If anyone is under any illusions as to the suffering faced by Wiesel, this photograph should be sufficient to show you a glimpse into the tragedy and horror that he has experienced. Or can it be seen on something else? 170 years before him, Edmund Burke also had the right idea as to what it would be to serve to be the greatest risk to liberty and prosperity. Now, it is very difficult to underestimate the sheer gulf in the difference between the life of Wiesel and the life of Burke. 
because Burke is as privileged as privileged can be. I mean, he's the son of a successful Church of Ireland lawyer. He founds himself um, at age 18, founding one of the oldest, I think, uh, undergraduate society in the University College Dublin. And by the age of 21, he abandoned a career in law to do 40 years in political commentary, statesmanship, and author. So he's a pretty big guy. He was at the front of centre of many of the great issues facing Britain back in the 18th century. Uh, examples of this would be uh, uh, the Roman Catholic emancipation and also um, detracting from the French Revolution, which he thought was a bit too liberal. But basically, why am I bringing these two people together? Elie Wiesel, uh, a Holocaust survivor, and this Edmund Burke, uh, an 18th century political theorist in Britain. It's very simple. They both recognised that evil was not the greatest threat facing the world in which they both lived. All civilizations are doomed to have bad people. However, the examples of where civilizations have done the most harm are not necessarily the ones with the greatest number of evil people, a proportion which, all things considered, has remained remarkably constant. It is the ones where people are willing to sit back and not do anything about the proposed injustices from the evil people. There's a quote, this is the quote, often misattributed to Burke, which encapsulates the sentiment perfectly. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. And I think you can all see the connection between this phrase and the suffering faced by Wiesel and millions of Jews and millions of victims under the Nazi regime. Now this is the indifference, I argue, that serves a far greater threat to the health and well-being of our democracy. Indeed, the whole concept of Western-style liberal democracy is predicated on a notion of participation and involvement, which is simple. In the UK, with Parliament, we elect representatives, i.e. members of Parliament, to voice our opinions. And to do that, we actually have to vote for them. This is the consent, this is the participation, and this is how everyone gets involved. It is the opportunity for legislation and representatives to be scrutinised in a proper manner, for example, in Parliament. Now, the ability to express support for these individuals and causes the matters to citizens of the state is extremely important. And Elie Wiesel would have given up a lot to be able to voice out his political opinions back in his time of suffering. Instead of cherishing this freedom, we have allowed it to rot. We have become complacent when given the right to vote and the right to speak. Now, why am I saying all this? Surely there's not enough evidence to prove that this is the outlying trend. And I concede that might be the case because from the very beginning, when I asked people to stand up, some people actually did. Some people actually weren't afraid to voice their political opinion, however uh, threatening to the friendship circles it might be, however outspoken it might be. I know I haven't made that much of a um, do in the first part. But here should be a sufficient example. One of the clearest indicators that we have for levels of political participation are the number of people who are consciously choosing to be members of a political party. In the United Kingdom, this, this data I think is taken from the House of Commons Library. And it is very plain to see what the graph about shows about the trend in party membership. Because ever since the 1950s, where it peaked at a quite staggering 4 million total participation in Britain, we have seen a pattern of almost terminal decline. And I have to uh, shift um, my speech a little bit to um, certain Jeremy Corbyn, who um, I like to express my slight admiration, despite, just, uh, like, despite not agreeing with his politics, that his brand of politics has rejuvenated people's desire to be involved in the labour movement, and that's why you see this little spike here. I think that's very, very interesting and important. But even Jeremy Corbyn, as a uh, venerable man he is, has not done anywhere near enough for political engagement as if you compare this to back in the 1950s. And we are very right to be sceptical for how long this trend will last. It will just keep going on lower and lower as voter apathy increases. 
to realise that this 1945 end of the Second World War was met with a sharp increase in political participation. This is on a clear basis of supply and demand. When you have just, when your citizens have just been wrapped with one of the greatest atrocities in all of humankind, in all of history, you cherish the freedom you have for democracy. You cherish your freedom and right to speak out. And now, perhaps because we haven't fought a war in a long time, we've just given up on that. Even a Liberal Democrat, who should have seen a surge in membership as one of the only clearly pro-European parties represented in the House of Commons right now, have only seen a very small uptick in membership. People have often suggested that the reason they do not support a particular party is the conception that all political parties are the same and have the same agenda. But the data suggests that ideological position actually has very little impact upon the actual membership numbers. The membership of all major parties is larger in the post-war consensus compared to the ideologically charged period between 1979 and 1970. Uh, 1997, sorry. And the situation in the last 10 years has not been much better for non-political forms of civic engagement. And if you are um, here to question me that this only shows about politics and not the general apathy of voicing opinions in societies in which we live in, this statistic was for you. Because this graph shows the percentage of people who are deemed to be actively participating in selected organisations. We can see clear stagnation or decline for all groups except for the sports and culture society, in which I am a proud member of. Though I'm personally doubtful that such a rise would have been observed had it not been for the normalisation of gym culture in public life and the raising of image consciousness through mediums such as Instagram. Such as Instagram. Instagram. Anyway, the reason why I presented Analyze this data is to hammer home the idea that people really do not concern for society as much as they used to. The 1980s, in my view, perpetuated the idea that the individual was the primary form of social organisation with families, local communities and the state serving as necessary evils which needed to be restricted. That is something that 20 years before John F. Kennedy will be able to see the folly of. Perhaps the most memorable line he's uh, talked of in his uh, leadership election, I think, is ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. I think there's a lot of merit in that. All too often, we have not been asking that question, the question that John F. Kennedy raised. The self-service which has been normalised has made politics increasingly like a zero-sum game. For example, locals can only lose out if immigrants benefit. White Anglo-Saxons will suffer in order to allow black and minority ethnic people greater freedoms. We have not concerned ourselves in the way in which politicians legislate. This is how we manage to slowly lurch into the largest financial crisis in more than 50 years. This is how popular resentment of the political order developed. And this is how uh, subjectively male malevolent people like Donald Trump and those who subscribe to his brand of politics were able to con people into electing a charlatan. We, the people, chose consciously not to give a damn. It is we, the people, who have allowed evil to become the new normal. It is only we, the people, through political engagement, who are able to turn back the tide of division, scapegoating, scapegoating and stagnation, which is coming to define many of the old liberal democracies. You can read the news, you can vote, many things you can do, but I argue the worst thing you can do right now is to stay silent. Thank you.